talk about recognition. And speaking of recognition, you might be saying to yourself, I recognize that guy. Isn't he the one that gives this geezer speech every year? <laughs> well, I used to be that guy. But here's what I decided to do instead. I let my geezer self take the retirement package. So, you won't be hearing about galoshes anymore, or Weight Watchers brownies, or oscopy reminiscences, or any other self-incriminating geezer gestures or behaviors. They've all taken retirement. But there's one thing. Position than any of us here 
to recognize what we have accomplished. When you live in a place day to day, you get used to change. Without paying much attention, you lose track of what makes now different from what came before. And that's where I need the help of my younger self to recover a sense of wonder and recognition of all that we have accomplished. And it's not just physical things I'm talking about. Buildings, although we have plenty of those to be proud of. My alter ego from 30 years ago would be amazed to find all those undergraduates living right on campus and residence hall halls that nobody back then would have imagined our needing. We got rid of the one housing unit we had. You remember Helen Huber and Joy? <laughs> nobody thought of building new dorms, let alone a fitness center. I guess we liked those new college times when we could have driven a car across the middle of campus most evenings without worrying about running into somebody. But that would soon change. Around the time I got here, we undertook the largest building program in the history of the university, one that would extend along Woodland and Cass from Tech Town and the new biomedical research building at one end, the new housing and commercial developments at the other, from the Eugene Appleton School of Pharmacy and Health Sciences to the Medical School campus, which would become the largest single campus medical school in the country. We built a new undergraduate library, as I said, and extended the Ruther Library. We created a new postal and a welcome center. And there at the McAdee's building, which we took over, we hung out our sign right on Woodward's, right on Woodward, Detroit's Main Street. And this is only a partial list. There's plenty more that didn't exist 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. It's not only new things that count, though. We've been looking out to the past as well. We fixed the McGregor Reflecting Pool, restoring that spectacular beautiful structure, which has just been designated at the National Historic Site. And we took care of old lane which is only fitting, since that building has played a central role in the history of this university, achieving iconic status, as we say, and deserving it. As far as recognition goes, it stands for something we recognize proudly about ourselves, which is the way we have kept faith with the past as we build the future. Which puts me in mind of a student of mine. His name's Jim. He's been working on his bachelor's degree for several years, balancing jobs with part-time school, we were discussing semiotics, as it's called, in class one day, talking about the way that signs work. Take an example, the stop sign, for example. There's the signifier, the red octagon, with its white letters, S-T-O-P. And there's the signifier, what the sign tells you to do, which is to put your foot on the ring. The two parts together, the signifier and the signifier, constitute a sign, according to the theory we were discussing. I propose that this kind of symbiotic analysis could apply to a lot of things when you think of them as signs, through hairstyles and food and fashion and music. So after class, Jim came up to my desk. He seemed agitated. How long have you known about this? He asked, meaning the theory of signs. I told him the theory was over 100 years old. He thought about that for a little bit. And he said, and do other professors in your department know about this? I said, and I was pretty sure they did. Well, then, he said, I've been going to school here for quite a while, and I want to know, why wasn't I told about this? <laughs> why wasn't I told? It's one of those light bulb moments. You could tell when an idea comes along that changes the way a person thinks and imagines the world. It's those moments that make teaching a great profession, and Jim had just had one. I always think of him and Old Lane together. That's where our class was held. But there's more to the association than just that. It's about our historic commitment and opportunity for students like Jim, along with the National Merit Scholars and the graduate and professional students who come from all over for a chance to study here, all of us together, that make this university both great and also special because of who we are and where we are. We honor the past while we build the future, which we do really well. That's how we achieve the highest Carnegie rating, Research One, as the designation was called when Wayne State first became such a school in 1994. And we would add to that the highest Carnegie rating for community engagement, making us one of only six public urban universities in this country to achieve both designations in recognition of our being committed both to this great city that we call home and also the great research mission that makes this truly a great and engaged institution of national and international reputation. Just to see what results I would get, I Googled Wayne State University accomplishments, and the search came back with three quarters of a million years. Not scientific data, maybe, but still indicative. Indicative of an idea of the university that drives this place. 
pet phrase, the idea of a university is one a Victorian author, John Henry Newman, talks about in a famous book where he set out to define what it is that we do. To open the mind, he wrote, to refine it, to enable it to know and to digest, match the rule and use its knowledge, to give it power over its own faculty, application, flexibility, method, critical exactness, sagacity. His description goes on like that for quite a while. Nobody could accuse Victorians of being short-winded. I think fondly of those folks, since they're responsible for my being here today. I was hired at Wayne State, it was many years ago, to be a teacher of Victorian literature. That's the field I had studied in graduate school. And while I would continue to teach and work in that field, I also got a chance to do something kind of like my student Jim. I had a light bulb moment of my own. I discovered a passion for Detroit, which has become the center of my research and writing, and the university supported me in figuring out what it is that I wanted to do, and then offered me what I think is the best job I can imagine having as the dean of the honors college. That's the kind of thing you come by when you stay true to your school. And that gets me thinking, here at the conclusion of what I've got to say about my former office mate, the guy who walked away from Wayne State before all the things happened that brought us and this city to the point where we are today. I guess you could say he didn't get it. The idea of this university and the idea of this great city, it's a kind of call, which is what my Methodist circuit riding forebears might have said, something that calls you out, that makes you want to do things you didn't imagine until you got the call. And the more that call gets shared, the more powerful it becomes for all of us, staff and faculty and students, all of us. So you look around at this marvelous place where people come together to change themselves and to change the world from all across the United States and from countries around the globe, and you begin to recognize what we have done, what we are always beginning again to do, reverence in the past, while we're inventing the future. It's a wonder. It's a wonderful to be here, and a gift, a gift that we've given to ourselves and each other that we share with the world. We couldn't do it without one another, and luckily for us, we don't have to try. Congratulations.